Anomers are the two diastereomers of cyclic hemiacetals of carbohydrates. And they're diastereomers because they differ only in configuration at the anomeric carbon, only at this carbon that is the carbonyl carbon in the open chain form and the hemiacetal carbon in the closed form. That's right here, for example, in these anomers of glucopyranose. Because these are diastereomers, they differ in their physical properties. For example, the specific rotations of the pure anomers are different. And recall that specific rotation is an intensive measure of the extent to which a compound rotates the plane of polarized light. So it's an angle indicating rotation under a standard set of conditions. For alpha D-glucopyranose, this value is positive 112.2 degrees, and for beta D-glucopyranose, the value is positive 18.7 degrees. So unsurprisingly, for these diastereomers, we've got different spe specific rotations. But interestingly, if we start with, for example, a sample of pure alpha D anomer, and we allow we put that in solution and we allow it to equilibrate over time we find that the specific rotation changes from the initial value of positive 112.2 degrees right here to an equilibrium value of 52.6 degrees. And here's another interesting observation. If we do the same thing with the beta anomer, beta D-glucopyranose, it starts out with a specific rotation of positive 18.7 degrees, but converges to the same equilibrium rotation, equilibrium specific rotation when in solution once it's reached equilibrium, 52.6 degrees. So whether we start with pure alpha or beta anomer, we converge to an equilibrium mixture of the two anomers that's somewhere in the middle, as suggested by this sort of average specific rotation that is in between the specific rotations of the two pure anomers. So what's happening here is an interconversion of the alpha and beta anomers via the open chain form. And because this leads to a change in the observed specific rotation of the compound in solution, it's called muta rotation. This is used both to refer to this phenomenon of the optical rotation changing over time and to the reaction itself, which involves the hemiacetal opening back up into the open chain, the aldehyde group, in this case, rotating around, an attack happening from the other side to a nucleophilic attack by the hydroxyl group on the carbonyl group, I should say, happening on the other side to generate the other anomer. And at equilibrium, we've got about a 33 to 67 mixture of the two anomers. And notice that if we take 0.66, the fraction due to the beta anomer, and multiply it by its specific rotation, 18.7 degrees, and 0.34, and multiply it by the specific rotation of the pure alpha anomer, the sum of those two is equal to 52.6. So the evidence for this 33 to 67 or 34 to 66 ratio is this observed specific rotation that is sort of a weighted average of the two anomers that we observe at equilibrium. So we've got more beta anomer than alpha anomer, for example, and we talked about the reasons for that on the last slide, having to do with the fact that in the beta anomer, we've got all equatorial hydroxyl groups, if we're talking about glucose. We can actually make an interesting observation of this basically two to one ratio of the beta anomer to the alpha anomer in glucopyranose. The expected ratio is quite a bit more in favor of the beta anomer. And this is expected on the basis of pretty simple calculations. For example, based on the cyclohexane A value for the hydroxyl group, the difference in stability of an axial versus an equatorial OH group in something like cyclohexanol with all carbons, we'd expect something more along the lines of nine to one or 89 to 11 at equilibrium. What we actually observe is quite a bit more alpha anomer, something like 66 beta to 34 alpha. So the alpha anomer appears to be more stable than, for example, a simple cyclohexanol where the equatorial uh, conformer of that compound is much more favored than the equatorial conformer here is over the axial conformer. This is because of a stabilizing effect on the actual axial structure, a stabilizing effect in the alpha anomer known as the anomeric effect. And I can't resist talking about this because the anomeric effect is rooted in a filled 
empty orbital interaction that only exists in the alpha anamer. So what we're going to do on this slide is show the orbitals, and this picture is already giving you an idea of what's going on, but we're going to draw them on top of the actual alpha and beta anamer models to see how this effect comes about. It's basically an electron delocalization effect, a kind of weak resonance effect that provides slight stabilization of the alpha anamer. Not enough to make it the favored anamer, but enough to make it more favorable or less disfavored, we might say, than we'd expect from naive considerations of something like cyclohexanol. So here's the basic idea. What's unique to glucopyranose is that there's an oxygen inside the ring, and that oxygen has lone pairs. Notice that a CH2 right there would have no lone pairs, and so the oxygen bringing in its lone pairs is rather, rather unique in, in that regard, and this is the difference maker between this molecule and something like cyclohexanol. So a non-bonding lone pair on that oxygen can overlap with anti-bonding sigma orbitals, sigma star orbitals that are in the vicinity of the lone pair, and one that is very well poised to overlap with the axial lone pair on that oxygen is the sigma star orbital corresponding to this axial anomeric hydroxyl group. And so I've drawn in the N or non-bonding orbital on the oxygen and a sigma star orbital on the carbon here, uh, the CO bond here, and we can see that there's great orbital overlap here. There's great N to sigma star type orbital overlap. And in fact, we can push electrons to illustrate this overlap by creating a pi bond between the endocyclic oxygen, the oxygen that's inside the ring, and the anomeric carbon. And let's draw out what that resonance structure looks like. So notice we now have a pi bond between those atoms. We've broken this, the anomeric CO single bond that was right here. And again, this came from electron flow like this. And this provides slight stabilization of the alpha anomer, again, over this naive sort of cyclohexanol-based model. And this is the anomeric effect in action. It's the stabilization of structures like this, where we have an N to sigma star interaction that provides a bit of delocalization of this lone pair on oxygen, which is uh, stabilizing. It's a kind of resonance stabilization effect. Now, what about the beta anomer? Well, if we draw the same orbitals aligned as they should be, for example, if we make sure to draw that sigma star orbital coaxial with the equatorial CO bond, well, now there's no good orbital overlap because the axial lone pair is kind of in this direction and the largest lobe of that sigma star orbital is now over here. So they're pretty much at right angles to each other, very close to right angles to each other in the equatorial conformer. And so there's no good orbital overlap. There's no anomeric effect in the beta anomer. So it doesn't benefit from the stabilization in the same way that the alpha anomer does. That's the anomeric effect in action. And this image on the right just shows you some actual calculated orbitals overlapping in a model of glucose that cuts out some of the unnecessary uh, carbon. So here we have the oxygen in the ring. Here's its lone pair. Notice here in this model, it's actually a pure P orbital rather than a hybrid. And then here we have the sigma star orbital for the CO bond. So here's a carbon, oxygen, and H. This carbon is the anomeric hydroxyl or our model of the anomeric hydroxyl. And so the orbital overlap right here is the essence of the anomeric effect. And if this hydroxyl, notice if this were in an equatorial position where, for example, right here, that orbital overlap would be much worse. So far, we've focused on the six-membered pyranose sugars for the most part, but carbohydrates can also form five-membered rings known as furanoses based on their resemblance to the five-membered oxygen-containing heterocycle furan. And the idea here is that the cyclization still involves formation of a hemiacetal. It's just now a five-membered cyclic hemiacetal rather than six-membered. And D-fructose is one sugar that forms an important furanose. Ribose is another that we'll see a little bit later. So the idea is we can identify a nucleophilic hydroxyl group at this carbon here. And that is, if we count the carbons, one, two, three, four, five. Five, so the nucleophilic hydroxyl group at carbon five is well poised to form a five-membered ring with carbon two, where the ketone group in fructose, which is a ketose, is located. So we get a nucleophilic addition to the polarized CO double bond, electron flow like this, and after the requisite proton transfers, we end up with a cyclic five-membered oxygen-containing ring, and this is known as a 
Uranos. Now, this addition created a stereo center at the anomeric carbon, right? There are two orientations we could imagine the ketone having. The carbonyl group sort of up like this or rotating around to swing the carbonyl group down where the CH2OH group is currently. And this leads to two possible anomers for furanoses, just like pyranoses. And here again, we use the terms alpha and beta to distinguish between the anomers stereochemically. And the convention is actually highly analogous to the pyranose convention. It has to do with the orientation of that newly created hydroxyl group in relation to the orientation of the bottommost stereocenter that sets D or L. So what I've done here at the bottom of the slide is drawn the two isomers, uh, the two anomers of fructofuranose, and we can see that they differ in configuration here. This is carbon-2 and it's the former ketone carbon. We should also note first off that both of these are D sugars based on the orientation of that hydroxyl group at carbon five, the bottommost stereocenter in the Fischer projection. And this is worth pausing and verifying, kind of imagine rotating the molecule around or rotating your own viewpoint to verify that this is indeed a D sugar. And then to determine alpha versus beta, well, we're looking at that carbon two and the newly created hydroxyl group and where it shows up in the Fischer projection. So for example, in the alpha anomer, which is here on the left, that hydroxyl group is pointed down in this Hayworth projection, and that corresponds to the hydroxyl group pointing to the right in the Fischer projection. So again, this is worth pausing to verify that this Fischer projection matches this three-dimensional model right here. Assume a viewpoint from this side, and you can verify this by thinking in three dimensions. On the other hand, and this sort of follows logically, right, with the hydroxyl group pointed up in the other anomer, well, the CH2OH and the OH group here, these are going to switch places in the beta anomer, which is drawn on the right here. So now that hydroxyl group, notice, points to the left at uh, the newly created stereo center kind of at the top of the Fischer projection. And this is the opposite direction of the bottom most stereo centers oxygen. And so with this opposite orientation here, that's the beta anomer with the OH and the bottom most oxygen stereogenic centers oxygen, both pointed to the right, we've got the alpha anomer when these point in the same direction. Now fructose is particularly interesting because it can form both furanoses and pyranoses depending on which hydroxyl group gets involved in the cyclization. So for example, when carbon-6 gets involved in the cyclization, then we actually end up with a pyranose, right? Carbon-6's hydroxyl group cyclizes. We've got 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. When that 6-2 bond is made, a bond between the oxygen here and carbon-2, we get a 6-membered ring. And so uh, fructose in solution at equilibrium exists as a mixture of pyranose and furanose isomers. And in fact, the same is true of glucose. But fructose is particularly interesting because we've got non-negligible amounts of all four of these cyclic sugar isomers in a solution of defructose. And to give a sense of the, the numbers here, and knowing these numbers is by no means required, I just want to give you a sense of what the distribution is here. Between the two pyranose isomers, we've got about 70% beta D. Notice that this jives with the glucose situation where putting that hydroxyl group um, in a beta orientation tends to be more stable than an alpha orientation in the pyranose. Same is true of glucose. On the furanose side, we've got much less overall, so the pyranoses appear to be more stable than the furanoses kind of as a rule, although this five versus two ratio is interesting. And we've got about 23% beta D fructofuranose and 5% alpha D fructofuranose. Now, if you add up all these numbers, you'll realize that we're basically at 100%. What about the open form? Well, the open form is there in less than 1%. About 0.7% is the open chain form. So very, very small amount of the open chain form. Now that said, as we move into discussing reactions of carbohydrates, that 0.7% is more than enough to react with the kinds of reagents we're gonna hit carbohydrates with that engage with carbonyl compounds. 
So we can still get carbon-2, or the anomeric or carbonyl carbon of fructose, to react as a ketone via the open chain form. And there we're generally taking advantage of Le Chatelier's principle. As this reacts and gets used up, more of it is made from the cyclic isomers, and more of that gets used up, and so on and so on and so forth, until the fructose is completely reacted. So we'll see reactions of the open chain forms of sugars in the ensuing videos on reactions of carbohydrates, and this occurs via this small but non-negligible amount of open chain form at equilibrium in solution for these compounds.